Hello everyone, my name is Francesco Tamagnini and I'm a lecturer in pharmacology at the University of Reading School of Pharmacy. Uh, I hope you're doing uh, uh, fine in these uh, um, unique times of uh, pandemic and uh, isolation. Um, so today I will talk to you about some of the things we do uh, in our uh, laboratory. Uh, my appointment is 50% research and 50% uh, teaching. So when I don't teach, I do research, and when I do research, I don't teach. But the two things, uh, uh, the two activities are interlocked with each other and they do inform uh, each other. And in particular, what we do in our lab is uh, uh, to study the electrical properties of nerve cells uh, in those parts of the brain that are involved in encoding memory and learning, and of course, the alteration of these electrical properties in those diseases which um, um, involve an alteration of memory and learning processes such as Alzheimer's disease. So you see my face now for the introductory slide. You also see a little bit of my study room. Uh, I apologize for, uh, for the mess, uh, but then you will not see my face anymore for the other slides, um, uh, for your own luck and uh, um, uh, because uh, the video just makes uh, the whole thing too heavy and my face would interfere with, uh, with the text. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I hope to see you soon. So in the first part of my talk, I will talk to you about the relationship between the electricity and the brain. And I will try to convince you that we don't use this information to generate the Frankenstein monster. Secondly, I will talk to you about uh, memory and dementia. What is dementia and what kind of biochemical, uh, structural, and of course, electrical changes occur in dementia. And finally, I will show you what kind of techniques we use in my lab to measure the altered electrical function in single nerve cells um, in normal brains and brains with uh, dementia. I'm talking about brains of mice which are genetically modified to overexpress proteins which are observed in dementia and how these data can help us in um, correcting or at least developing uh, treatments and uh, uh, diagnostic and prognostic tools for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So one of the basic questions is how the brain, something physical and at the look of it quite disgusting, can generate something abstract and beautiful, such as uh, poetry, maths, uh, philosophy, and Sheldon Cooper. And the answer is that we don't know that. And that is uh, not only a scientific question, it's quite a strong, um, how do I say, philosophical uh, question. Yeah, what is the relationship between mind and body? Um, is there a separation between mind and body or our mind is the product of the processes that carry out, uh, that are carried out in, my, in our bodies? including our brains and for sure i don't have the answer of that to he in here and it's not even the aim of my work trying to give an answer to that however what we do in our labs can provide some information not only to try and address these uh, philosophical questions but also to better understand the biological basis of cognition and of course the biological basis of diseases and disorders which affect cognition such as Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So in the first part of the talk, uh, as promised, I will talk to you about electricity and the brain. Um, as a matter of fact, I shouldn't say just and the brain because every living cell, which, you know, as you know probably, possess a bilayer of phospholipids is characterized by a separation of positive and negative charges um, which generate an electrostatic potential which is as a matter of fact uh, quite strong much stronger than the electrostatic potential that there is between the sky and the ground during uh, a summer storm and so this energy, this information can be used uh, to uh, generate a sinister artificial intelligence form that will subdue and destroy humanity, or 
it can be used by us to collect information on how the brain works and how the brain does not work in uh, disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and dementia and uh, develop new treatments, uh, new uh, diagnostic tools and new strategies to improve people's quality of life. So it all started uh, with Luigi Galvani. Um, uh, Galvani did not discover the fact that there is electricity flowing through the body that is known since a memorable time, probably already since the Greeks. But what Luigi Galvani shown was the causal relationship between uh, a current flowing through the body, for example, between the spinal cord and the hind limbs of a frog, and the contraction of the hind limbs. So the causal relationship between the passage of a current and a specific function. For the last three centuries or so, now we do know that the origin, um, if you want, of that electrical activity can be identified in the separation of charge that exists between the extracellular and the intracellular space of a cell. And the separation of charge is mediated by the um, plasma membrane bilayer of phospholipids. And so what we can do is to uh, impale cells with the electrodes uh, or at least um, um, uh, record, uh, well, place electrodes inside of the cells and record the changes in these um, uh, in these membrane potential. And also we can probe the cell, single cell, with uh, uh, current stimulus generators and see what happens to the And in this way, we try to collect information of how single cells uh, process information, store information, and generate responses to the stimuli that they receive. So here, for example, you see uh, an experiment coming from my lab where I inject a square current step, and then you can see the change in the membrane potential, which at the beginning just uh, logarithmically increases. So we can say that the uh, membrane potential encodes the information of my current injection in an analogical way. Then at some point, you've got this discrete event known as action potential, um, which is a digital way of processing information. And then discovery of the action potential is by these two chaps, Hodgkin and Huxley, which in the 1940s described the action potential in the giant axon of the squid. And soon I will show you, and hopefully I will convince you, on how measuring the properties of the action potential can be useful for studying functioning of the mind and the alterations in functioning of the mind in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is known as a progressive uh, chronic neurodegenerative disorders, which is characterized by progressive cognitive decline, progressive speech impairments, and progressive emotional uh, and mood alterations. On the left-hand side, you can see the brain of a person without Alzheimer's disease and uh, without dementia. And on the right hand side, you can see the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease in its advanced stages, reduced volume, reduced surface to volume ratio and enlarged ventricles. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia and it can be caused by pure genetic factors such as in the case of familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, which counts for 0.1% of the overall cases of Alzheimer's disease. Um, it is fairly rare, but in that case, it means that if you inherit an allele which is associated with familial Alzheimer's disease, it's almost certain that we, you will get Alzheimer's disease. And then we have got sporadic forms of Alzheimer's disease where the genetic uh, factor and uh, the genetic factors and the, envi the environmental factors such as type 2 diabetes, alcoholism and smoking are known to increase the probability of getting Alzheimer's disease, but you still may not get it. And we don't know exactly what is the pathogenetic mechanism that 
leads to the onset of Alzheimer's disease in sporadic forms given these risk factors. So what we do know though is that in Alzheimer's disease we do have the accumulation in the extracellular space of the brain of this uh, insoluble protein called amyloid beta protein which accumulates in plaques. And once the plaques reach a certain amount, uh, the first signs of cognitive decline start to appear. And these initial stages are known as mild cognitive decline. As the accumulation of amyloid beta progresses, the cognitive decline becomes worse until at some point uh, these tangles of a protein called hyperphosphorylated tau protein start to appear and the nerve cell degeneration, the nerve cell death starts. That's where the severe cognitive decline starts to kick in and where full-blown dementia is diagnosed. So now we regard these two proteins, the amyloid beta and the tau, uh, the hyperphosphorylated tau protein, not only as hallmarks of the disease, but also as potential causative factors of the disease. All of these should be um, associated also with the alteration in the electrical activity of the brain. As a matter of fact, in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, we do not see a reduction of the electrical activity, but an increase of electrical activity in a way that is very similar to what we observe in people with epilepsy. So, a way to study the alterations in the electrical activity in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment to understand what is the relationship between this altered epileptic-like electrical activity and the onset of the disease could be electroencephalography, which consists in putting electrodes in the, on the um, skin, on the scalp of a person. And surely you can get a lot of information out of that. Um, but you know between your electrode and the brain there is a thick layer of bone known as skull and also you've got the skin and hair and all sorts of stuff so that kind of information comes somehow dampened it's a little bit like looking at someone through a stained or satin glass you can still get some information i can get some information about this person I can tell quite confidently that it's reading a book that book is on that person's right hand. I would infer it's a male from the way it dresses, but I can't tell that for sure. So already I've got an uncertainty here. Um, for sure, I cannot tell by this image whether or not that person has a mole on the right hand side of their upper lip. So if I want to know that information with that degree of accuracy and uh, um, resolution, there's not another way than breaking the glass. But I cannot break the skull of people to measure the, ele the electrical activity of the brain, and that's why we do use animals in research. So in my lab, we do use genetically modified rodents, which show uh, hallmarks of dementia. We slice their brain and we use the brain slices kept alive uh, in a solution called artificial cerebrospinal fluid. And we place these brain slices into a machine called electrophysiology rig, which has a powerful microscope uh, which allows me to visualize single cell bodies. And then I do have glass micropipettes filled with a solution that resembles the composition of the inside of the cell. Uh, and then I can, through a micro manipulator, uh, um, get closer to the plasma membrane of the single cell, suck the membrane in, break the patch of plasma membrane, and then have the inside of the pipette being in touch with the inside of the nerve cell. So now you can see that my pipette is in contact with the inside of a nerve cell into a complex network, which is the brain slice from a mouse with hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, which is pretty cool because it allows me to get a lot of information. How? Well, this pipette is mounted onto an electrical amplifier 
uh, the solution is in contact with a silver chloride wire, which is connected with an amplifier, which is connected with an analog to digital board, which is connected with a PC, which allows me to observe the electrical changes in the potential of the cell. So, for example, uh, I can inject through this system a square current step and observe my nerve cell uh, firing action potentials. I've already mentioned these um, uh, phenomena. And what I can do is to measure the width of the action potential, the maximal rate of rise, the threshold and the peak. And all this um, um, information is relevant because uh, the plasma membrane structures which are responsible for the shape of the action potential are proteins known as voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. Not only that, Hodgkin and Axley in the 1940s have shown that the laws that regulate the generation of these action potentials are mathematically represented both which is quite awesome because usually mathematical models are not quite um, accurate in predicting the behavior of complex biological systems, but they're quite good when it comes to electrophysiology. So for example, in a paper I published some years ago, uh, we observed that uh, in uh, genetically modified mice uh, overexpressing amyloid beta, we do observe a reduction in the width of the action potential. And when we used, well, not exactly this equation is a bit more complicated than this, but you know, this equation kind of represents the core of the bigger equation that we used. We run a simulation. So these action potentials are actually coming from a computer in which we input the information that we obtained from the experimental data. And then we observe that in order to go from the normal phenotype to the uh, diseased phenotype in our simulation, we needed to increase the maximal conductance through voltage-gated potassium channels. And this is kind of cool because that is a protein and that can be the target of a drug. Or we can take this uh, change in electrical activity and use it as a parameter to diagnose Alzheimer's disease by using non-invasive methods such as e so to conclude, um, to answer the question, can I study the electrical properties of neuronal cells in Alzheimer's disease? Yes, we can do that uh, with uh, a single cell resolution with patch clamp, of course, uh, in non-human models and electroencephalography uh, with uh, a lower resolution, but uh, in a non-invasive way in humans. And how these and does this help curing Alzheimer's disease? Well, we will not know until that will happen eventually, but for sure what we can conclude is that these tools can help the development of prognostic tools uh, and uh, 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 novel treatments for dementia and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much uh, for listening and thanks also to all my collaborators on this side and the other of the channel. I hope again you stay safe uh, and I hope to see you in person soon. Bye bye.